And when a man is from God and has a word in his mouth from God, that makes him a messenger of God. And I saw in the Quran in three places, it talked about messengers. And one was where Abraham was asking God to raise a messenger from among his people that would be his descendants. Then again in the Quran, I saw a place where it said that a messenger would be raised from among the illiterates. But then again in the Quran, I found a place where it speaks of a messenger who would be raised from among the believers. The believers who had gone astray and needed someone to guide us back to the right path and someone that would help us in the purification process. And I found this man, and I believe, in my humble judgment, judgment that his name is the Honorable Louis Farrakhan. So I want you to receive him when he comes to us. As he is coming right now, I present to you the Honorable Louis Farrakhan. In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful, the one God to whom all praise is due, the Lord of the worlds, Allah, the creator of all things, the giver of life, the sustainer of life, the revealer of all truth and the sender of all prophets. To him alone do I submit and seek refuge. As a Muslim, I thank Allah for Moses and the Torah, and I believe in Moses and the Torah. As a Muslim, I thank Allah for Jesus and the Gospel. And I believe in Jesus and the gospel. And as a Muslim, I thank Allah for Muhammad ibn Abdullah and the Holy Quran. And I believe in Muhammad ibn Abdullah and the Holy Quran. But if I lived to be a thousand, I don't think I could thank God enough for raising up in our midst a divine leader, teacher, and guide. One who makes the Torah, the Gospel, and the Quran relevant books and guides for the oppressed in America and throughout the world and one who makes the Quran the gospel and the Torah relevant books to all of humanity that humanity may come out of the bondage of sin and that person of whom I speak is my teacher the man who taught me what I know and gave me the example of the person I'm trying to become and that is the Honorable Elijah Muhammad.
I greet all of you, my dear brothers and sisters, with the greeting words of peace. We say it in the Arabic language, Assalam Alaikum, but in English it means peace be unto you. Thank you. Thank you. To uh, Minister Philip, would you stand? I think. Uh, Minister Philip, he's a new minister in this area. And to all of the believers of Mosque Number 67, those visitors and friends who helped to make this night possible, from the depth of our heart, we thank you and we say a job well done. Thank you, Brother Minister. Thank you. To our regional minister, Minister Wazir Muhammad and Captain Wali Muhammad and the FOI who came to aid Minister Philip and to all of the brothers and sisters who come to be with me wherever I am to offer their help and to secure me from the depth of my heart. There are no words that are adequate enough to say thank you to all of you, FOI and MGT, but I must say that I am willing by the grace of God to spend my life and to give my life to be worthy of the honor that you show me in protecting my life with your life. Thank you very, very much. <laughs> to the distinguished members of the clergy, civic leaders, politicians, rostrum personalities, members of the press, Brothers and sisters, it is a great honor to be here in Seattle once again. I was reflecting that the first time I came here was 20 years ago, uh, this December, and I was invited here by one Keeve Bray, who used to publish a newspaper here, and he was the first man to invite me to this area. And I was struck by the immense beauty of Seattle. Not only the beauty of the terrain, but the beauty of the people. Seattle is, to me, like an experiment in the northwest corner of the United States. Now wait, did I say something? wrong and it seems as though it is an experiment to see if human beings of different races nationalities creeds can learn to get along together in peace I don't know how well the experiment is going, <laughs> but I certainly have not come uh, to disturb your peace. <laughs> but just to tell the truth. in hopes that the truth will give real peace and not false peace. Real joy and not false joy. Peace is the most prized and sought after gift for the human family 
but the human family is not able to find that peace because the rulers of this world have slaughtered those who brought the way of peace. And they have superimposed their way as God's way and made humanity bow down to a false way instead of God's way. So the scripture says there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the ends thereof are the ways of death. And since death is over America, and death hangs over Central and South America, and death is now hanging over the Middle East and Africa and Asia. In fact, the earth is under the curse of death. Not because we have obeyed God and found his way to peace and carried it into practice, but because we have used our own understanding and followed the devices and the desires of our own hearts and have been led astray or have gone astray so that the peace that we appear to have in Seattle is not really a lasting peace because oftentimes it's based on a false premise. There are those who say that Farrakhan's presence is divisive as though you all are united. Uh, and there are those who say that Farrakhan's presence is injurious to the wonderful relationships that we have in Seattle and his presence is not a good thing because he doesn't believe in what we believe in. He believes in separatism as though white folks believe in something else. Dear people, we're not going to solve problems by being hypocritical. One man a, in the area of Tacoma said that Farrakhan is a racist and a sexist. His religion even promotes sexism. My God. And uh, of course, it appeared as though he got away with that. Well, I'm here now and uh, I can, by God's grace, adequately defend myself. And I can adequately, by God's grace, defend what I teach and to those who are black and to those who are white to those who are Chicano and to those who are Asian and to those who are Native Americans you listen and weigh what I say and if I am a racist and a sexist and a bigot and an anti-Semite you know where to put me you put me in the garbage pail where all of those type of persons belong. So there's no need to fear my coming. Because if those who have been your teachers have done their job well, you should be able to determine a racist when you see one.
Now, let's get down to business. <laughs> they say, Farrakhan is a separatist. I never gave that label to myself. They didn't ask me, what are you, Farrakhan? <laughs> they began to tell me who I am. I reject that. Let me define myself. And if my definition is incorrect, then correct me. Of course, everyone wants to look good to themselves, whether they do or not. And if I thought I were a racist, a bigot, an anti-Semite, I don't think I could wake up in the morning and face myself and be pleased with who I see. Well, how would you describe yourself, Farrakhan? Oh, I describe myself as a person who hungers and thirsts to see his people free. I describe myself as a person who is pained at the division in our community over religion, politics, caused by ignorance. For the scripture says, my people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge. I am pained and appalled at the degree of ignorance that afflicts the American people, but particularly black people. I am one who is a Muslim. Muslim is an Arabic word and we are not Arabs. So I have to explain that word. Well, Farrakhan, I'm not a Muslim. Yes, you are. Well, wait a minute. I have professed the Lord Jesus Christ. So do I. Well, how does that make you a Muslim when I am a Christian? These are labels. And we have to at least be as intelligent as the wino. The wino doesn't care what the label says, he wants to know what are the contents. So if we can get past the label, we might find that we are family. And that's what we want to find tonight, a sense of family. Black family, human family. Let's see if we can find it. What is a Muslim and why do you say we are all Muslims? Allah says in the Quran, set your face for religion, being upright, the nature in which God created man and there is no altering Allah's creation. God says he created man to be upright. He created us with the nature of himself. Jesus didn't give us that nature. Muhammad didn't give us that nature. Moses didn't give us that nature. Abraham didn't give us that nature. They, like we, are born in the nature of God. And the nature of God is peace. And that peace comes through obedience to his will. God sets up law and is above the law but he obeys his own law 
and he creates us to submit to his will willingly or unwillingly we have to come here by means of law and we function whether we know it or not by means of law and we are created to bow down to a higher power than ourselves so if you look at the teachings of all of the prophets they never gave a name to their religion until the coming of Muhammad ibn Abdullah and he named the religion or Allah named it Islam and Islam is an Arabic word which means obedience to God's will and he says in the Quran that he will not accept another religion from human beings except our obedience to his will and if you look at Abraham and Moses and Jesus and Muhammad all those whom we love and admire if you sum up their teachings their teachings could be melted down into one word obedience obedience to God so Moses said hear and obey is that right he didn't call his religion by a name he just taught principles and laws and statutes and said to those who heard him obey these and you will have blessings rebel against these and there will be cursings I set before you today two signs one a cursing one a blessing one of life one of death choose life that you and your seed may live and that life is obey him who is the author of life the creator of life the sustainer of life the giver of life certainly he knows best how we should live the life that he gave us so he commands us to submit our will the planets have no other alternative they bow and that's why you enjoy the earth and the seasons and the changes and the fruit of the earth because the earth obeys the law under which it is created and it never disobeys a fraction of a second so every time you breathe the air or eat the fruit of the earth and clothe yourself from the animals of the earth and feed from the sea you are feeding from obedience to live in rebellion are you listening Jesus said don't just be hearers of the word be what when he said in request or answer to his disciples master teach us how to pray he said pray in this manner our father not my father Our father letting you know that the same source that made him who he was is the same source that can make you like unto him do you hear what I'm saying our father which art in heaven hallowed be my name no hallowed be thy name listen carefully now my kingdom come uh-uh baby thy kingdom come my will be done uh-uh thy will be done on earth even as it is in heaven what was jesus saying i'm a servant of one greater than myself i'm not the equal of my sender and i'm not asking you to worship me worship the father in spirit and in truth oh you can't argue with that that's your bible
Prophet Muhammad Ibn Abdullah, peace be upon him and Jesus and Moses, they all taught us commands from God and they told us to obey God. And if we obeyed him, we would find the path to peace and we would come into the favor of God. All right, Farrakhan, come on with the racism. You're sounding too religious, Farrakhan. <laughs> I am a Muslim. I believe in submitting my will to do the will of God. That's what I believe and that's what I'm attempting to carry into practice. Well, just a minute, Farrakhan. Don't you think God wants human beings to love each other? Certainly. Why haven't you? <laughs> Farrakhan, don't you think God wants people to live together in peace? Certainly. Why haven't you? You say, but we're trying. Why now? What do you see coming? What is your motive? You didn't want to be with the Native American before. You didn't want to be with the Asians before. You certainly didn't want to be with black people before. Why you want to be with us now? Oh, you are finally waking up. We applaud you for that. Very good. Very good. What stimulated your awakening? We're getting along fine, they say. Really? Oh, really? We don't want that Farrakhan guy to come in here and interfere with black Jewish relations. What relations? <laughs> Who are you relating to? And on what terms are you relating? Let's talk together. Let's reason with one another. Hmm? How many Jewish friends do most of you have? None. So who are they relating to? Uh-huh, people up here. The leaders. The preachers, the pop, they're not relating to you? Well, how, come, how do you have good relations then if you're not related? That ought to be a nice question to answer. A husband and a wife have good relations and they don't see each other. They don't sleep with each other. And if you have good relations, on what terms? And as long as black people accept inferior status, there's peace between black and white. But when black people want to assert themselves for justice and equality, all of a sudden you're crying out too much. You want too much. We're not giving you en anymore. If two people can't get along in peace, rather than slaughter each other, they ought to agree to disagree and go to the judge and say, Your Honor, our differences are irreconcilable. We, we tried to make it. But since our differences are irreconcilable, Your Honor, we plead to grant us a decree of divorce. But of course, Your Honor, I'm dependent. I don't have anything. I've given everything to my husband. He's been caring for me. Go ahead, brother. 
And now, Your Honor, I have all of these children and I need help. Your Honor, I pray that you will do justice. And even after we're separated, make him pay. <laughs> I guess you've heard that before, haven't you? Now they say Farrakhan is a separatist. I describe myself. Well, Farrakhan, is it true <laughs> that you want black people to have their own nation? Yes, that's true. <laughs> well, what's the matter with this one? The question has to be put back to you. Do you want us as a part of this nation? We've been here 400 years trying to get along with you and we haven't been so successful yet. We have to make a future for ourselves and our people and we can't lay around here waiting for white folk to make up their mind to do justice by us. Now they want to make me the bad guy. I say, sir, ma'am, just a moment. Did we come here integrated? Is it not true that our fathers were brought here? We didn't come on the Nina, the Pinta, the Santa Maria, or the Mayflower seeking freedom? That's the truth, isn't it? Yes. And when you got us, you didn't integrate us. You put us in the holes of the ship. And we were living and dying in a stench of our own excrement while you were topside. We weren't integrated then. You separated us. That's right. Huh? When we got to the Caribbean and here in America, you didn't allow us to live with you. You separated us again. Right. True? <laughs> and after we fought in the Revolutionary War to help you get independent, fought in the War of 1812 and fought in the Civil War on both sides, to preserve your union. You still, you still never integrated us. While we were in your army, we had to beg you to fight. And we didn't fight integrated, we fought separated. We were the black regiment, don't you remember? In the Navy, we were se segregated. In the Army, we were segregated. Don't you remember? You didn't want us to drink water from the same fountain that you drank water from. You didn't want us to go to the same toilet that you went to toilet with. You didn't want us to eat in the same restaurant that you ate in. And you didn't even want us to be buried in the same cemetery that you were buried in. Have you forgotten? So now, was it not you and not I, Farrakhan, that wrote in the Constitution separate but equal? Farrakhan wasn't even born then. Why are you going to call me a separatist when it appears that all your life you have never wanted to live with the darker peoples of the world but live from them?
And here we are in Seattle, Washington in 1990. Where do you live? You live in a white neighborhood? They got you somewhere across some track somewhere. Some few of you live in an integrated neighborhood. If the skinheads have their way, you'll be back in the saddle again. So now, 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 I don't have the power to separate. I'm not a city councilman. I'm not a mayor. I have no judicial authority. Who gerrymanders? Who redlines the districts where black people live? Is that Farrakhan doing this? Or is that you doing this? Now you want to put your sins on me because I recognize a reality that we have not been able to get along in peace. Therefore, why shouldn't we separate and do something for ourselves? That's not hate. That's recognition of a reality. I'm a bigot, they say. Can you imagine any white writer having the gall, the unmitigated gall, to call Louis Farrakhan a bigot. You know, it's like a skunk urinating on somebody and saying, mm, you stink. Any resemblance to any persons living or dead is purely coincidental, of course. I'm not trying to be facetious. And I'm not trying to be funny. Because the condition is too serious and too grave. But sometimes, if you can laugh, painful truths can be taken better because it's not done out of malice but it's done to show those who like to label others with themselves that that's you that you're talking about and not me they call me a racist can you imagine this? I mean, I really feel highly insulted that you would call me what you have been all your life. Do you know that the only reason a man like me is necessary is because of what your fathers have done. I have to come and teach people what they should know naturally under normal circumstances. You don't have to teach a dog to love itself or to have some compassion for another dog. You don't have to teach a cow to have compassion for another cow when the cow is being slaughtered in the view of another cow. But somebody got to come and teach black people 
how to love themselves and how to be merciful and compassionate to one another. Why? Why is it necessary for a man to spend his life to teach human beings how to be human beings? If you had done your job as a teacher right, I would not have to waste my life to try and make a people out of a people that your people have destroyed. And because God is blessing Farrakhan to be listened to at last by his own people and loved by his own people and they are trying now to make something better of themselves because of the presence of someone like Farrakhan. Now the government and the forces of government want to make me other than what I am so that my own people won't listen to me and perhaps you can kill me like you have killed all the others. It is not wrong for white people to look out for themselves. That is nature's decree. And we can never fault a creature for wanting advantage for itself. You cannot fault white people for making a factory and hiring their own who are jobless in front of you you and i should wake up That's right. to nature if someone hires a white person who is in need of a job and they are white and you say I, I was more qualified. Uh, I graduated from Washington University. I, uh, I have a master's degree. And they overlooked me and hired this white person. They're racist, wrong. They're obeying nature's law they're looking out for their own kind your problem is you don't know who you are you don't know where you belong you don't know what time it is What white people have done for us is enough. They allowed you into their schools. People are coming from all over the world to study in America. You are the best educated black people on the earth. And you are the richest. Even though individually we may be poor. But our poverty is not in money. Our poverty is in ignorance. This is where we are poor.
if the government economists are correct, over $260 billion flow in and out of our hand in one year. That's an awful lot of money, brothers and sisters. We're complaining. Look, the Koreans are in our community. Everywhere you look, there's a Korean store. See, see, see. The Arabs are in our community. Look at them. You can't blame other people for seeing an opportunity and taking advantage of it. You are not providing the goods and services for yourself and your people. Now you are angry with others for making merchandise out of you when you refuse to use yourself. Then somebody else will use you. I know, I know, <clears throat> this is not quite pleasant, but it is truth. We are a people who need help. We've got the knowledge. We have many skilled people among us, but what we are lacking is direction of that skill guidance and the knowledge of self that will allow us to know self, to respect self, to love self, to unite with self, that we may work in behalf of self. That's not racism. That's nature's law at work. Here's where we fault white people and others. When you seek advantage for your race to the detriment and disadvantage of other human beings, that's not racism. That's not love of your people. That's downright wickedness. And it is that that you are being called to account for today. It is the fact that wickedness, not race, but the wickedness of race, God made race. God gave us hues and colors, but we have taken the thing that makes us different from another and made them either badges of shame or badges of honor. We have set up a criterion that God has not set up. We have set up color as a criterion for justice. This is not race. This is wickedness of race. And we're going to address both. Race and the wickedness of race. Are we all right? Yes, I'm not going to keep you long, Seattle. <laughs> racist. What is a racist? Look at the word. Racist. The suffix I-S-T, wherever you see it, it denotes the degree of commitment, proficiency, and excellence of the person to that particular noun. I am a violinist. That means I've dedicated my life to 
the study of the violin. I have become proficient at the playing of the violin. Consequently, I'm called a violinist. <laughs> if I give my life to biology, I am a biologist, a physicist, a chemist, an artist. And if I give my life to see the advancement of my race, my people, if I try to do all within my power to reverse the trends of a race that is on the verge of extinction, on the verge of self destruction if I commit myself to such a people who are in need of somebody to make a commitment not leading for and in behalf of many and forgetting the commitment to the people most in need if I do that then the positive denotation of my commitment is racist but the connotation is that I am wicked if I look out for the interests of my people and that is a damn lie There is no Jew who is a good Jew who will not look out for the interest of Jews. That's right. And no matter where a Jew suffers on the earth, a Jew will speak out for the hurt of another Jew. And that is not wrong, that is correct. It is unfortunate that when Mr. Mandela came to America, he spoke out on behalf of the problem in South Africa. But he never spoke to the hurt of black people in America. He should never be put in that kind of political castration. When your people are suffering all over the world and you have become an international hero, then speak to the pain of your people wherever you are. But of course, he's a wise man. He came here for a purpose, to raise money, to free members of the ANC and repatriate them back. And he did not want to say anything that would upset the apple cart. But we could have taken the same position where South Africa is concerned. we spoke out for our brothers and sisters in South Africa. And wherever we are suffering on the earth, none of us, none of us needs to think that we can only speak for the hurt of the people from whom we directly come. For black people all over the earth, our one family and we're catching hell wherever we are on the earth so we must speak for the whole people so in the positive sense of the denotation of that word I am a racist but in the connotation that I am wicked, that I want to set white people at naught in order to create advantage for black people, that is a lie. This earth is a wide expanse. 
it is able to support every one that it allows or God allows to come up out of it it can support white people black people brown people red people yellow people it can support the total human family and we all can do better than what we are doing no I don't want advantage for black people to the detriment and disadvantage of white people only if your advantage comes from the colonization, the slavery, the death and destruction of my people, then if that's where you get your advantage, your advantage is finished. <laughs> There is no need for one people to subjugate another for the sake of advantage. The earth is sufficient to sustain us all. That kind of racist with the connotation, I'm not that. I have never taught one person with me to do one thing of harm to one white person. Think about that. Think about it. And then see if those are just words or watch our actions. You can't find one thing in my record that I've done to harm a white person. If I'm so much an anti-Semite, show me one Jewish person that any one of us have harmed. And if I'm their teacher, and I hate Jews, you ought to be able to see it in my students. You can't find it. We have not boycotted one Jewish store. We have not painted a swastika on any synagogue. According to the holy book, of Islam it is our duty to protect every house where God's name is remembered whether it is a mosque a temple a synagogue a cloister a cathedral whatever it is as long as that house is dedicated to the worship of God we must honor and respect that house according to our own scripture Well, so I'm not that. <laughs> well, all right, are you a sexist? And by that you mean one completely devoted to the advantage of my own sex? Please. <laughs> How could I be that when I came from a woman? How could I be that when my first teacher was a woman? My first doctor was a woman. And the one that made me the kind of man that I am is my own beautiful black mother. No, 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 no. No. I'm not a sexist. And by definition, you mean one who wants to see women put down. I'm the very opposite of that. Because I understand that the reason the world is in the condition that the world is in is because when a man puts a woman down, he puts himself down because it is through the womb of a woman that the nation comes. So any man that mistreats a woman is not only imprudent, he's a fool. <laughs> this book, Quran, does not countenance the mistreatment of women. 
In fact, when it talks about the believing men, it talks about the believing women. The patient men, the patient women. The persevering men, the persevering women. Together. Always together. Because God created us to complement each other and to be interdependent upon each other. But this world has destroyed the proper relationship between male and female and made us enemies of each other like we're fighting each other when we should be working together to produce a better world reality. So, now that we've gotten the garbage out of the way, I want every Caucasian person in this audience to listen to me carefully in this critical part of the lecture. <clears throat> because while it may appear that you all are getting along fairly nice in Seattle, I want to represent that Seattle is not America. Seattle is not even a microcosm of what America is. So don't get up in this northwest corner and get lost in fiction and illusion. Let me help all of us to see some reality. I like to get away from this rostrum and walk a little bit. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, listen. Did you know that under segregation, black people had to depend on themselves? We couldn't trade with white people, so we had to trade with ourselves so we were building a black economy when segregation broke down we started spending our money with others and the businesses and the economic development that had started for us under segregation we tore it all down under integration come on now look at this. Many of our young people bore the brunt of the effort to break down segregation. Young black people were bitten by dogs, hit with fire hoses, cattle prods, and we opened up the door for homosexuals and for women and for other quote unquote minorities while we who opened the door for them had doors now shut in our face so that the masses of black people are going backward while those whom we opened the door for are going ahead why is that listen to me carefully now Martin Luther King Jr. Do they have a street up here named after him? That's good. Every time they kill a black leader, you know, we name an alley or a street after him, you know. That's supposed to make you feel good. Where do you live? Oh, I'm, I live down Martin Luther King Drive. That's very nice. But let's look at Dr. King a minute. Our brother, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. wanted to make America a more just place for all of us to live. He wanted to see the day when color 
wouldn't be the criterion by which we moved people ahead. He wanted to see the day when people would be moved ahead on merit. He wanted America to rise up and live out the meaning of her creed that says all men are created equal and are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights and among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And Dr. King was willing to suffer to make this change. But we didn't know this, but when Dr. King made that harmless speech in Washington, I have a dream. What dream, Dr. King? I have a dream that one day, little black boys and little white boys will be able to walk together. That dream presented a nightmare for some whites. And the day that Dr. King moved 150,000 people there in Washington, D.C. in 1963, the next day, a letter appeared, a memo appeared on the desk of J. Edgar Hoover from one of his field representatives calling Martin Luther King Jr. the most dangerous Negro in America. Why was he dangerous? Listen to me, brothers and sisters. Why was Dr. King dangerous? Because he was growing in influence with his own people and even with white people. So from that moment, the FBI, many of whom are here tonight, <laughs> and I don't want you to r rely on your memory. You can get the tape. The FBI, under the counterintelligence program of J. Edgar Hoover, went to work to destroy Dr. King, Kwame Ture, formerly known as Stokely Carmichael, H. Rap Brown, now known as Jamil El Amin, Whitney Young, even the innocuous NAACP leadership Felt, they felt threatened by R Roy Wilkins. And they sent spies in to every black organization. On the West Coast, the group called Us and the Panther Party had as many agents in them as they had sincere followers. They worked among the Native Americans, I'm talking about the government, to destroy effective leadership. They put us against each other, even causing some of us to kill one another. And according to their own Senate subcommittee hearings testimony that is in black and white from the government press, Every trick that the FBI and the CIA used to destabilize governments around the world, they brought them home and they used them on black people as though we, who have been the most loyal, are the real enemies of this nation. Martin Luther King is dead because the government of the United States wanted him dead. Malcolm X is dead because the government of the United States wanted him dead. Marcus Garvey was deported because the government of the United States couldn't tolerate a black man having five million followers and speaking like no black man had ever talked before him. The government of America did not like noble Jew Ali. The government of the United States of America has not liked any black person who began to grow in influence among us. Paul Robeson, 
William E.B. Du Bois. You name the black leaders that were effective and the government worked against them all. The government that we pay taxes to. The government that we have fought, bled, and died to uphold is the worst enemy of black people today. The government of the United States of America is the worst enemy that the black man has. Does that strike you as radical? Hell no. It's the truth. And if the government agents that are here tonight just come, I'll prove this or die. You know it and I know it. Many of you who didn't know some of these facts, you know that I couldn't say it if we didn't have the facts to back it up. The enemy has always been the government of the United States and the enemy of us today that is plotting the death of a people is that same government. Just hold on a minute. Don't get excited. If you get scared, you can sneak out. <laughs> but I'm doing the talking and I'm not afraid. So don't you be. Just listen and weigh it for yourself. Martin Luther King was doing all right as long as he was telling black people to be nonviolent. If white folk beat you up, just take it. <laughs> Suffer peacefully. That's what he said. That's what he taught. We will show them more love than they can show us hate. And we will change them with the power of love. Dr. King did not understand the nature of the people he was dealing with. No, 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 no. I want you to listen to me good tonight. Because I may not get back here for a while, so I want you to hear me tonight. There's nothing wrong with saying that Dr. King didn't understand the nature of the people with whom he was dealing. He thought he could love them into a better way. That don't work. It never has, not with the mindset of this people. I'll get into that in another minute. Bear with me tonight, please. Dear brothers and sisters, please listen. Martin Luther King went to the government and said, look at the condition of black people. We need help. Lyndon Baines Johnson, the President of the United States, stood up and gave a hypocritical speech where he took the theme of the Civil Rights Movement and said, we shall overcome, and said he was going to wage a war on poverty and put billions of dollars into the black community to change the conditions under which we were living, but then Nixon, I'm sorry, Johnson widened the war in Vietnam, falsifying a Gulf of Tonkin incident and sent a half a million soldiers to Vietnam. A disproportionate number of them were black, Chicano, Native American, and poor whites. You didn't know why you were in Vietnam. You said it's to protect democracy. 
And this is the stuff that they tell the soldiers, poor people, to make them fight and die for a reality that they know not of. Black people died in Vietnam. And Martin Luther King saw that the government was spending billions of dollars in Vietnam that Johnson promised to spend in the ghettos of America. So Martin Luther King started talking against the war because it was the war that was sucking the economic blood of America that should have been going to make you have a better future. That's right. So when Martin King spoke against the war, the government intensified its efforts against Dr. King. They bugged his home, they bugged his office. They tried to get the Pope of Rome not to see him. And they tried to keep him from getting the Nobel Peace Prize. They tried to make Dr. King kill himself by sending him a tape of an affair in some hotel and told him if he didn't do the right thing, which is to kill himself, they would send the tape to his wife. And when Dr. King would not kill himself, stood up like a man they sent the tape to Miss Coretta Scott King Dr. King played the tape for Ralph David Abernathy everybody in the inner circle knew that the government was on Dr. King and the day he was killed somebody in authority took away the police the same ones that were protecting him And a new group arrived. And Dr. King was dead. And what the government didn't know was how much King was respected. Even though many young blacks didn't believe in his philosophy, they believed in him as a man of justice. And so when Dr. King was killed, over a hundred cities were set on fire. And this shook white folk up. Who's the leader? Who led this rebellion? A hundred cities set on fire. There must be a leader somewhere teaching these Negroes how to burn our cities. <laughs> and so Lyndon Johnson impaneled the Kerner Commission to find out the cause of the riots, the rebellions. And you know what? Here's what they found. There was no leader. It was a spontaneous reaction because through television, black people had been fed on the nightly news the pain and hurt of our people and we had developed a common attitude toward the oppressor and the oppression. And right after Martin Luther King's death, Watch what happened. Every black television show that spoke to the hurt of black people was taken off the air. Subtly, there was no more talk of black. Black was dead. We used to have soul. We used to have black on black. We used to have all kind of black programming. Then the language was changed and you became the minorities. Now when you all, you leaders talk, uh, the minorities, we in the minority community, shut up! You have never been a minority. You have always been the majority. But as long as you see yourself as a numerical inferior, then you will also see yourself as a political and social inferior. You outnumber Caucasian people on the earth 11 to 1. You have never been a minority. You are the majority and they don't want you to connect with your people all the way around the earth.
<clears throat> the Kerner Commission said that there were two Americas, one black, one white, separate and unequal. And at that time, there were 12 and a half million black people in the inner cities of America. And the Kerner Commission said, unless the government of America taxed itself to solve this problem by 1985, there would be at least 21 million blacks in the inner cities. And if that happened, it would be impossible to integrate black people into the mainstream. In 1960, uh, 88, the Kerner Commission went back and reviewed their findings of 20 years earlier. And they said, sorry to say, there's still two Americas, one black, one white, separate and unequal. And now, guess what? There's 26 million black people in the inner cities of America. And according to their scholarly findings, 26 million people, it would be impossible to bring you into the mainstream of American life. So now you're in the cities and white folk fleeing the cities, taking the tax base with them. Listen now. The jobs are leaving the cities. And you black men in American cities are jobless, unemployed and unemployable. Now the cities have become seething cauldrons of bitterness, frustration, despair, and hateful actions. And into that, just bring some drugs. This is your way out of poverty, young man. All you have to do if you want to wear Nike shoes, alligator shoes, just sell some crap. Hustle your women. Carve out some turf for yourself. Police are involved in the drugs. And somebody's bringing guns into the black community. AK-47s are not made in America. We don't have any import license. Uzis are not made in America. But we have these guns today. And we are slaughtering each other in the cities of America. And the billions of dollars that it would take to correct the intolerable conditions under which we live. America does not have the will anymore to do anything for black people. In fact, there is an anti-black mood that has been created by the media in this country. And I want you to listen to me carefully now. President Reagan was a conservative man. He didn't care nothing for black people. And in eight years, he stripped away all the advantages that had come to us from preceding presidents. Set a conservative Supreme Court in that would reverse the gains of the 60s. Listen to me carefully now. <coughs> and then the press started highlighting weak 
uniqueness in the black community as though we are the only people that use drugs. 80% of the drugs used in America are used by white people. But if you look at the news, they make it appear as though the only people using drugs are us. Now you look at young black men. We are the victims today, brothers. No job for you. No education that is proper. So you can't make a future for yourself. And you can't make a future for your people. So you're out there now with nothing to do, nowhere to go. And so drugs seems to be the right thing to do. Gang warfare seems to be the right thing to do. So the press highlights this. The Bloods and the Crips in Los Angeles, they were in the news week after week. Did you see Death Wish 1? Death Wish 2? Death Wish 3 is talking about vigilante. And who they're killing? You. You can't see that there's a swing in America that is anti-black. And now black folk, white folk are killing black folk more last year than the year before. That's bad, but what's worse? What's worse is that you and I have become so self-destructive. Did you know that one person is murdered every 24 minutes in America? And if that continues at the end of this year, over 23,000 human beings will have their lives snuffed out by murder. And do you know how many of them will be black people killed by black people? Over 10,000. And do you know how many lives we lost in Vietnam in nine years of war? We were 35% of the casualties. We lost between 17 and 18,000 according to their statistics. But in one year, we've lost over 10,000. That means that two years in the ghetto, we will die more than nine years in war in Vietnam. So the ghettos of America are less safe than the jungles of Southeast Asia. Listen to the statistics, brothers and sisters. Listen to the statistics. Any white woman that is present in here tonight, the statistics say that you have one chance in 606 white women to be murdered during this life. One white woman in 606 white women will be murdered, they say. One white man in 186 will be murdered. One black woman in 126 black women will be murdered. But black men? One black man out of every 21 they say we'll be murdered in this life. Don't you see black man? We have become an endangered species. Don't you see black man? This is not an accident. This is a conspiracy. And our ignorance is being manipulated by the conspirators. Why is there conspiracy? The conspiracy is because they fear your growing numbers. The birth rate of whites is diminishing. And they say that by the year 2000, the birth rate of whites will be at zero population growth, one birth for one death. But if your population growth continues as it is going, by the year 2083, blacks will be the majority population in America. Do you know what that means? 
that means that there will be a radical political economic and social change in America in less than a hundred years so wise white people who don't want to see America turned over to you have said like Pharaoh come let us deal wisely with them lest they multiply and join on to an enemy of ours and come against us so what did pharaoh plan kill all male children of the children of israel and spare the female now one out of every or rather 24 percent of all young black men in prison on parole or under court supervision that's our race that's our people and now our youngsters are dying from infant mortality at a higher rate than any other people we're losing them at birth and we're losing them for abortion and we're losing them before they are young they are being killed, young men killing young black men. So we have become our own worst enemy. And that's why I'm going throughout this country on a stop the killing tour to help us to understand what we're doing to ourselves. Beloved brothers and sisters, Bear with me just a few more minutes. We are under assault. And the government is preparing for another level of assault on the black community. That's right. I want you to hear me. Yes, sir. If I sound crazy, just listen to me. You know what they did to the Native Americans. The Native Americans were offered blankets, but in the blanket was smallpox. They have been dealing with germ warfare and chemical warfare for a long time. How many of you heard of the Tuskegee experiment? Where Black men were injected with the most virulent form of syphilis and allowed to have sexual relationships with women. And as they got sicker and sicker, they would go back to the clinic and they were never to be treated for syphilis. This is an experiment that is actual fact and now AIDS AIDS killing black women black children and black men in disproportionate numbers they say it's from intravenous drug use or being a homosexual but according to what we've read Black men are dying in Central Africa and they don't know anything about homosexuality and they've never been drug uh, users. Most scientists and doctors with whom we have spoken say that the AIDS virus is not a natural virus but it is a synthetic virus and the Russians accuse the Americans and the Americans accuse the Russians of manufacturing this synthetic virus that is slaughtering human beings human beings of color more so than human beings who are Caucasian I respectfully suggest that we are under siege and before the American government makes an attack, the press is always used to create the condition to make it ripe for the slaughter. 
So before America tried to kill Muammar Gaddafi, they put it in the newspaper, he's a terrorist. He's a terrorist. He's a terrorist. They blamed him for the massacre in the Rome and Vienna airport. They blamed him for the bombing of a discotheque in West Germany. And then President Reagan sent bombers on the most expensive assassination attempt in the history of the world. An assassination attempt that failed. When they got ready to attack Panama, they first made Noriega a drug dealer. If he were a drug dealer, the CIA had known it. For the CIA was his paymaster. The CIA was his teacher. The CIA was his mentor. But when he refused to play ball, the government of the United States, through the press, began to call him a drug man, a drug man, a drug man. We got to fight a drug war, a drug war. So when you see the president getting rid of a man that's dealing in drugs, you applaud him. So on December the 19th, while the people in Panama were preparing for Christmas, Mr. Bush gets out the stealth bomber and again blacks Chicanos Native Americans and poor whites are in the service and they land in Panama and they bomb Panamanians do you know who they killed they bombed the Chorillo district of Panama City not one bomb fell where white people live. They murdered hundreds and thousands of blacks and mestizos in Panama City and they bombed Cologne on the east coast of Panama which is an 80% black city. What did you bomb them for? Trying out your new weapon on black people and then get a black man Colin Powell to stand up and apologize for you even though he was not in on the planning and now a disproportionate number of black soldiers are in the desert of Arabia to protect the vital interests of a nation that has never made you a vital interest. You built the country. You fought, bled, and died in all America's wars, but you are not a vital interest. President Bush will spend $500 billion to bail out the savings and loan industry but he won't spend nothing to bail out suffering black people and now they're tired of us and they're tired of me but the question is how to deal with me and how to deal with us Make no mistake about it. I'm public enemy number one. <laughs> They're afraid to kill me outright because it would produce revolution. <laughs> so they wanted to get me in the courts. What are you going to charge me with? <laughs> You'll find something. <laughs> but since you couldn't get Mayor Barry, 
and you had him put him on film and still couldn't convict him you had 67 counts on Reverend Al Sharpton each count carried at least a minimum of seven years in prison and you couldn't get one count to stick you had Congressman Harold Ford and there was a hung jury you had Adnan Khashoggi and Imelda Marcos and you couldn't get them so the courts are no longer the lynching grounds for black people that are politically dangerous so it's back to the tree again back to the old methods that work but this time to my Muslim brothers they want to use a Muslim to kill me so that they can claim it's some internal strife but don't you be fooled they are in South Africa today stimulating the strife between Nkata and the ANC they are there and the same police forces that are instigating the death and the slaughter in South Africa manipulating real tensions and differences are also in Los Angeles manipulating the Crips and the Bloods so as we near our conclusion beloved brothers and sisters death is over the whole planet today people love death and not life they have no respect for life people think more about things than they do about human life so we kill one another over things do you know what this is brothers and sisters in my pocket here's some money this money has a dead president on it <laughs> and it is paper but it is paper that has been assigned a value that is recognized by everyone in this context as having value if I fold it up it makes no sound if I cast it down it makes no sound if I stomp it it makes no sound because this is an illusion Come on. it only has value because we give it value but you are devalued in the society and devalued in the world so to kill you You don't get time when you kill one of us. Maybe a little time and it's over. We place more value on diamonds and gold, on buildings of stone and mortar than we place on the human being. I have traveled throughout this world by the grace of God and I've seen beautiful mosques with gold on the minarets, pure gold, magnificent carpet, marble, magnificent craftsmanship. I visited St. Peter's in Rome, gold 
everywhere on the walls majestic steeples and domes the Saint Sophia mosque in Turkey the Taj Mahal magnificent buildings and I see preachers today marshalling the congregation come on we got to build a house for the Lord and when we build this magnificent structure when we go in it, we must be silent. Shh. Uh, 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 uh. Don't make that kind of noise. We're in church now. And you see people tipping around the church. And when they get near the altar and want, oh, no, 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 come up here. This is the Holy of Holies. Stand down, stand down. something made of stone something made by the hands of men adorned by us that's our vanity but this this is not made by men this is the creation of God this this is a sacred house this is the real house of God that all the stone houses are only replicas or representatives of I visited the holy house in Mecca dear brother and in the sacred Kaaba which is built of nothing but cinder blocks with a black veil over it, a golden door to it. You open the door, there's nothing in there, but they call it the house of God. Does God live there? <laughs> Talk to me! Does God live there? No! But I see people acting as though that house has more power in it. And yet, we mistreat a human being in whom God can really dwell. You say, wait a minute, God cannot dwell in a human being. If he can dwell in a house, damn it, made of stone, and you call that God's house. And I say, who am I and who are you and who are we? The scripture says, God in the last days will be among his people and he will dwell not just with them, but dwell in them. In them. That means that this magnificent human body can be and shall become the dwelling place of the spirit of the most high God. Think with me. Think with me. The Quran says God's throne is on water. And the brain, 14 billion brain cells, made of water. And it is here that we can see without eyes. These eyes are signs of the eye of the mind. People who know how to tap the energy of the wealth of the human being can visit places that they've never been before and see them clearly not with these eyes but with the vision of the mind and we can hear people speaking past conversations future conversations that have not even been spoken yet all of this is done 
with the power of a mind opened up by the power of God. The human being is the greatest of all God's creation. There is nothing that God has created to equal the human being. The sun is magnificent, but it can't think. The sun is magnificent, but it can't rebel. It got to be what God made it to be. The mountains are majestic and magnificent. The moon, the stars, all of the insects and creatures of God, they don't think. They can't say kun fayakun. They can't say be and make it come into existence. But the human being can vision. And the human being can organize resources and bring thought into concrete reality. The human being is the image of God. The human being that we slaughter as though it is nothing is the glory of God. But what has happened to the human being? We have become beasts in human form. We have become vipers, poison adders, in the path, lying tongues, deceitful mouths, envious hearts, wicked hands that scheme and plot and plan the destruction of human life. You magnificent woman, do you know who you Ah, do you know what you represent? Magnificent woman, no matter what your color, woman, do you know who you are? You are made, created by God after the magnificent womb of the universe. The universe is pregnant, always bringing forth new things. The universe is the womb that God operates on, in, and through to manifest his own glory. Listen to me. The womb of the universe, dark space, but even in the darkness, there is light in the darkness because God saw light in darkness and brought light out of darkness. And God saw white in black and brought white out of black. Listen to me, listen. Don't get excited. Don't be angry. But two white people cannot produce yellow, much less red or brown. Certainly, you cannot produce black. That's not racism, that's a fact. This, oh man, listen, just give me a few more seconds. This book, Quran, talks about Adam, the first life. And this Quran says, Adam was created out of black mud. Talk to me, Muslims. Fashioned into shape. Well, now, if Adam was created out of black mud, he wasn't a white man. So the Quran is the truth. And anthropology bears witness 
Dr. Leakey went to study the origin of man. He didn't find it in Europe. When Dr. Leakey found the origin of man, he had to go to Africa. And he found the origin of man, the bones of a black man that he called Zinjanthropus. And Zinjanthropus had a father. And he went back and he found the bones of the fathers of Zinjanthropus. And he said he found bones over two million years old. Time magazine had on the cover of it a black man looking something like an ape and a white man standing with his hand on the black man's shoulder and it said from man to mankind mankind is the white man he's man but he's a kind of a man from the original man So you didn't want to get happy over your color and make it a badge of honor, think again. Because you didn't have no color till we gave it to you. We are your father. And we are your mother. And the Bible tells you, honor your father and your mother that your days may be long in the land which the Lord thy God giveth you. Woman, the womb, your womb, is a sacred place. It is here in the womb, dear mother, woman, that God operates. And from this sacred place, in total darkness, Yet God has created light in the darkness of the womb. What does that teach us? There is nothing hopeless. The only hopeless thing is when you don't have the knowledge of the darkness. No human being should ever think of suicide. No matter how dark it is. God brought light out of darkness. There's always a light somewhere. But you got to believe long enough to will the light into existence. Listen, listen, listen. Woman, talking to you woman, this sacred womb, a man injects the germ of life into this sacred place that that sperm may go on a sacred journey in a hostile environment. So don't complain about the hostility of America because the environment in America is no more hostile than the environment of the vaginal tract into which each one of us was cast to test the strength of our worthiness to come to life. And the odds that you and I and we would make it were from a hundred million to one to a billion to one. Those are odds that no gambler would take. But yet, in the darkness of the womb, with millions of sperm trying to get to the egg, only one could make it. 
And that one was you. And that one was you. So the race is not to the swift, but to the one that can endure to the end for many are called, but only a few are chosen. Look at how valuable you are. And from this day on, never defile your sacred self again. You had to swim upstream like the salmon against the force of gravity. So don't talk about how hard it is to attempt the uphill road because you made it as a non-sinking thing. Surely you can make it now that you can think Oh, praise is due to Allah. Come on, hang with me now. We're at the end. Don't leave me. Just hang with me. Look now. Woman. When the sperm fertilizes the egg, in the head of the sperm is the coding of who you are. What you can become in the sperm and the egg. There are three dimensions. There's the past. There's the present. And there is the future. None of us are one dimensional. I am the past. I am the present. And I am the future. Look. Look at yourself. You didn't just pop up. You are direct descendants of the creator himself. Oh, let me say that again. I don't want you to misunderstand me. I just want you to know why you shouldn't kill one another. Why you should respect human life. Why you should honor who you are and then be yourself. Brothers and sisters. Brothers and sisters, this beautiful life that is given to us is so magnificent if I had the time tonight to actually show how from a speck of dust based upon law and principle God built this beautiful, magnificent body of ours from dust and water and minerals forming the bone of the body and from the vegetation, the flesh of the body. If you just look at this vegetation look at your skin and take a leaf from the tree and see the veins in the leaf and the pores in the leaf and look at your own body you are akin to nature and nature is akin to you I don't want to lose my place in this I just want to develop it as best I can. When that sperm meets the egg, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, the first cell of life begins. And in that first cell of life 
is contained the tot human being. Don't think, dear mother, that there's nothing there when you have an abortion. Don't think that way. You do have the right of choice. Exercise it. Choose the man properly. You do, you do have the right of choice. You can choose to be moral or immoral. You can choose to be virtuous or not. But once life is conceived in you, you don't have the right to choose to kill human life. Listen to me, just listen. I know this is painful, but hear me out. The government says you, you should have an abortion. This is a killer. It's all right, is it, for your young son, 13, to kill his neighbor? No. It's wrong, isn't it? Isn't it? You wouldn't countenance that, would you? And how many of you have cried at night because somebody in gang warfare killed a member of your family? But you grew to know them. You grew to know them. You grew to love them. You grew to feel them. You wanted a future for them. And it was snuffed out. What about the life inside your womb? My blessed mother got pregnant with me under not the best circumstances. And she told me late in her life that she tried on three occasions to remove me from her womb by means of a hanger. And she failed three times. And she decided to go on and have her child and face the consequences of what she had done wrong. Before she died, I visited her sick bed. And as she lay dying, she cradled her stomach and she said, I thank God for what my womb produced. She said, son, she said, son, do you remember when I told you that when I was carrying you in the womb, I saw the road that I was walking on all of a sudden begin to get so steep that I began to fall backwards. And I became so afraid and a voice cried out and said, pray. And I said, but what shall I pray? And the voice said, say, Lord, help me to overcome my difficulties. And she said, when I repeated those words, the road went down and became smooth. But she did not know that the circumstances of her pregnancy, which was that my father was not her husband. And she did not want her husband to know that she had been unfaithful. My father was her first love, but he was a handsome, light-skinned man that liked to play around. 
She got rid of him and married my brother's father and had my brother, but then my father slipped back into the picture and she became pregnant and desiring to hide her sin she decided to kill what was in her womb and God would not let it be and so as she decided to take courage and face whatever her own deeds had brought about she began to pray and my mother's prayers went into the forming of what was growing in her womb do you understand me now look at me I'm a product of what you would call an adulterous affair. <laughs> like Solomon was a product of an affair that took place according to the Bible's version because he saw Bathsheba and wanted her you didn't hear me you women who may be pregnant and the circumstances are not right and to hide the circumstances you wish to destroy the fruit of your wounds but I say to you, you do not know what you are killing. Because the answer to all our prayers is coming through the womb of some woman. The answer to AIDS, the answer to sickle cell anemia, the answer to cancer, the answer to war is coming through your womb. That same womb that produced a Napoleon, a Genghis Khan, a Tamerlane, a Hannibal. That same womb produced Moses, Abraham, and Jesus Christ. Who do you want to produce? You can produce Jesus all over again. If you want to. Oh, Farrakhan, that's an awful thing that you just said. No, it's a wise thing that I just said that the wise should plumb the depth of and even the fools. Now listen, it's time. I say that about myself to let you know, mother, that your womb is sacred and you do not know what you are producing. And because the circumstances are not proper, it does not mean that you should not have what life is now in you for the glory of God. Even though what happened was out of the law of God, it was adulterous. Look at the product. Now, can you judge the affair? Are you wise enough to judge my mother when you see her son? <laughs> see? So don't you run around judging what you don't know about. Just handle it. And no matter, sisters, how many of you have had abortions in the past? I'm not here to make you feel guilty. I don't want you to feel guilty. Lift up your heads. Because what was is done now. And we cannot undo what was done. 
but like Jesus when he found the when the woman was found in adultery and brought to him and the people had the stones in their hands ready to throw he said wait a minute the one who is without sin cast the first stone then nobody could cast because they all were wrongdoers so Jesus said woman where are your accusers they had all gone listen to his words he said neither do I accuse you go and sin no more you cannot be accused for what you have done in ignorance but now you know better come on let's do better so those of you who tonight are pregnant and were thinking about getting rid of it please no matter how negative the circumstance go on have your child and vow tonight that what you are producing you're going to give it to the service of God and tonight you will reverse the trend the negative trend of rejection now you see Farrakhan you say boy he got courage look at him they don't like him but he stands he don't back down from what he says he stands why do I stand and face what I have to face because my mother when she was forming me in her womb she decided to face yes. what she had to face yes, and she did it with the help of God and she made a young man courageous and I'm telling you sisters you have the power to make your womb produce with God's help one of the great minds you can do it you can do it and that's why no man should disrespect a woman no man should beat a woman no man should abuse a woman because to abuse a woman is to destroy your future because she can make the child hate you from the womb or she can make the child love you while it's in the womb she can make the child look like you she can make the child long for you she can make the child lean towards you or she can turn the child against you right from her womb a woman is a dangerous creature to mess over brother and now brothers and sisters to close and I don't want you to move please did you read in the scriptures about a pale horse whose rider was death and hell followed closely behind you ever read that if you didn't it's the four horses of the apocalypse the pale horse with death as the rider it actually represents the human condition men can be beasts or we can be reflections of God it depends on who the rider is the horse is the most intelligent of all the beasts but if the horse is ridden with death as the rider then hell has to follow 
wherever death leads the horse. I'm, I'm, I, I'm at the end now. Just hang with me. You are an intelligent being. But whatever rides your intelligence, whatever is the governance of your intelligence, if it's death, then hell will follow you wherever you go. Have you seen people that say, well, I just need a change of environment? But wherever they go, hell goes with them? <laughs> it is because the wrong rider is controlling and directing your intelligence. Follow me now, I'm almost finished, right there. A horse has to have a rider and the rider has to break the horse in order that the horse will allow a rider to ride it. Mm. Death became the rider of the pale horse. And what is death? Life is obedience to God. Death is rebellion to God and when rebelliousness to God is the governance of your intelligence then your mind becomes death and everywhere you go hell follows right behind follow me now to our Caucasian friends in the audience the Holy Quran says that God gives to people their rule by turns. And there is no doubt that white people have been and are the rulers of the people of this planet. And white people have been allowed by God to go out into space to conquer the depths of the sea and to master as much as they could but look at you everywhere you have gone hell follows you now listen don't be angry with me please I want to show you what has ridden your brain. You are highly intelligent. You couldn't rule the world unless you were intelligent. But you see, when God gives you the scepter of rulership, he gives you guidance. Why? Because you're not ruling what you created. You're ruling what he created by his permission. So he gives you the guidance to allow you to rule his creatures. But if you rule contrary to his guidance, then you set up an unjust rule. Then your rule will come to an end. And that unjust rule will bring about a day of judgment. And I saw a pale horse Death was the rider and hell followed closely behind. Everywhere you've gone, the native people that opened their doors to you, you brought death to them and hell to their people and generations. I'm not lying on you. This is your history. Why did you do this? Because you, Caucasian people, leaders I'm talking to, not the masses, but the leaders, you set up a contrary rule other than the guidance of God. I want you to hear me well. You see this black book? This is a black book. This is a white handkerchief. This handkerchief is cloth. This black book is paper. 
This cloth does not weigh as much as this black book. They're not the same in weight, in size, in color. They don't have the same purpose. But when I drop these two things into a law, will the black book hit the earth faster than the white handkerchief because the black book is heavier and blacker it ought to get there faster <laughs> how many of you think the white will hit first because it's lighter raise your hands how many of you think the black one will hit first because it's heavier raise your hands come on and how many of you think they'll hit at the same time? Let's see. Can you see? Can you see? You all got to watch this so you can tell them if they can't see it. Now check this out. I'm putting them at the same height. What happened? Same time. They hit at the same time, didn't they? Yes, Why? This is not the equal of this. But the law right. renders everything equal. equal. All men are not created equal. Right. All men are created equally. There's no such thing as equality. From the tiniest insect to the furthest planets, no two things are the same. Some run faster than others, some weigh more than others, some are taller than others, shorter than others, lighter than others, smarter than others, wiser than others. Talk to me. But the thing that makes us all equal is the law. That's right. And when God makes you a ruler, he gives you a law by which you can rule his creatures. And if you rule by God's law, you don't make mischief. But if you put God's law behind your back and say, well now, because I am white and this is white, this will get more justice than this black thing. Then you are creating mischief. And that is considered a mind of death because you are in rebellion to God's will and God's law. Can you see it? Have white people set up a just rule? No, sir. Come on. No, sir. Oh, you can say it louder. No. Thank you. And whenever you have an unjust rule, brothers and sisters, you create all of this division and havoc. And what whites have done is to make the color of skin the badge, the criterion by which justice is measured. And I say this with respect, that that kind of mind has to be destroyed in white people or you will never see the kingdom of God. That kind of mind cannot be accepted because that mind of white supremacy has produced this mind of black inferiority. You see, God didn't make niggas. God didn't make Negroes. God didn't make colored people. The book says God made man. So if you are less than man, that's not what God made. God didn't make freaks. Come on. God didn't make drunkards, thieves. God made man. And black man, God made you. And he gave you dominion the capacity to rule and as long as you live under white people they will never allow a black man dominion 
so as long as they have that mind you will never be a man you will always be a nigger a coon a shine a ham bone a burr head a boy he'll do more for your woman than he'll ever do for you because your manhood is a threat to his dominion so when a black man stands up with dominion white folks say we got to get rid of him because he was made to rule and now his time to rule is up you hear me god has said this is the end of that kind of unjust rule and I saw a black horse and the rider had a scale in his hand a balance somebody coming with a just mind a balanced mind that will respect God's law and deal justly with the people Well now, brothers and sisters, do you want to throw off the rider? Yes, sir, sir. That's riding you? Yes, sir. That you got hell everywhere in your house, in the school, in the neighborhood? You got this hell because the wrong rider is governing your intelligence. And if you will let God become the rider, then life will come in the place of death. And so Seattle, Washington, I am so happy and thankful that I was permitted to be here with you tonight. And I hope that as you leave this place tonight, that you will see yourselves from this night on as sacred. Did you hear me? Your flesh is sacred. Your minds are sacred. Never again should we shed the blood of one another. Of course, if somebody attacks us, we have to defend ourselves. But we should do everything in our power to keep from destroying human life. Your life is sacred. So from this time on, don't leave. When you leave here tonight, you look at the person next to you and around you, that's your family. That's sacred. So you know the way you tip in the church? I want you to be respectful as you meet one another. And when you see each other, smile. Because you're looking at what God made. And you ought to be happy to see what God has made. When you look at one another and you see your brother or sister acting a fool, don't say, oh, that fool. <laughs> say, mm, death is right. My brother's intelligence. Woo. Let me see if I can get it to throw off the false rider and let God ride him today like he rode him in the beginning. And as it was in the beginning, so shall it be in the ending. And the reason all of us love Jesus is because Jesus allowed God to ride his intelligence so that he became a perfect reflection of the wisdom, the spirit, and the mind of God in the flesh of a human being. And this is to show every human being what you potentially can become regardless of your color. So no matter what the color, we all can do better if we throw death off as the rider. 
So from this night on, if you're a Baptist, a Methodist, Episcopalian, Catholic, Jehovah's Witness, Church of God in Christ, Sanctified, Pentecostal, AME, CME, <clears throat> Seventh-day Adventist, yes, Lutheran, mm -hmm. Mormon, huh? Methodist, Calvinist. Shh. Those are the divisions that man made. If you Sunni, Sufi, Shiite, Hanafi, Hanbali, uh, 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 don't glory in that. Because God didn't make that. That's man-made. If your tribe is Iroquois, Sioux, Chippewa, Arapaho, Mohawk, huh? God didn't make that. That's your thing. Right. God made men into tribes and families that we may know one another and not despise one another. So be a Baptist if that's what you want to be. But don't blame that on Jesus. Because Jesus was baptized, but he never said, I'm a Baptist. Jesus, are you listening? Jesus was not a Methodist, but he had the method. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus never said, I'm Catholic or universal. He said, I am the light of the world. Talk to me. He never said, I am the Jehovah's Witness, but he certainly was the witness of Jehovah. He never said, I'm holiness. He said, if the first fruit is holy, then the love is also holy. He never said, I'm a Pentecostal. But without Jesus, there would have been no day of Pentecost. He never Y'all all right? Yes, sir. He never said I'm African, Methodist, Episcopal. Come on. But his mother was an Egyptian. Right. Yeah. And he was born in Palestine, Northeast Africa. <laughs> so he was African. All right. He had the method. That's right. And he was the bishop. Uh huh. He said, I am Alpha and Omega. I am the beginning and the end, saith the Lord. So you see, all these divisions are artificial barriers that keep the house of God from coming together as a people. Now what about these Muslims and all their things? Muslim? Prophet Muhammad don't know nothing about Sunni. He just gave us the Sunnah. He never told you call yourself Sunni. Tell me about it. He never told you call yourself Shia. He didn't know nothing about Sufi. He didn't know nothing about Hanafi or Hanbali. That's your thing. He said you're a Muslim. And that's all he is to it. Bow down your will to the will of God. Jesus has never told you to worship him. He never put himself on the equal of God. Never. 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 When Jesus was talking, he said, Why call it down me good? There's none good but the Father. Talk to me. Jesus never told you pray to him. Never. He said, pray to the Father. Pray in my name. And he will ask you. He will answer you. Is that correct? Then why are you worshiping Jesus rather than worshiping his Father? See, you're wrong. That's why you don't have power. Because you worship the servants of God rather than God. You take common men for God. 
when he has no equal no rival or no partner he's one God from whom everything came and he's one God to whom everything must return so from now on you can be these things but don't let these things mess you up don't run around here talking about I'm light <laughs> you too black my hair is curly. Mm, your hair is nappy. Stop talking like a fool. God made hair. He made some straight, some curly, some woolly, some nappy. So what? That's his craziness too. You're not black because you're cursed. You're black because you are the original life in the universe. So be happy over who you are. The creator's nation. Now rise up and be yourself. You don't have to sell drugs no more in life. And you can have the best that life has to offer. If you come back to yourself and be yourself, you can will yourself and work your will and come into power without robbing anybody of anything. Do you believe it? Look at these young men. Look at how clean they look. Talk to me. Have you ever seen any mark like this? Look in their faces. Light in their skin. Look in my face. and talking about you tired you should be tired of the crazy life that you live in death is riding your intelligence that's why you sit down in Burger King and Wendy's and Mickey D you don't want to let them feed you they're killing you for a profit all that nasty greasy food then you go home and kill that ugly nasty pig Nothing but worms and little trick now worms in its flesh. And you're going to sit down and eat ham and hog maw and chitlins and fat back and wonder why your back is so fat. Come on now. the wrong food. I know, I know. I loved hog too, sister. Believe me. I, I used to eat, make a hog head dance. <laughs> till I got some sense. Now, I don't eat that stuff. Look at my eyes. Look how bright they are. 
Some of your eyes look like stoplights. I don't know whether to stop or proceed with caution. Yellow and red and brown. Some of your skin look like you see people in the, in the cemetery or in the funeral parlor just as ashy and dead looking. Look at the life that's in our skin because we're living in accord with life. Oh, and look, we're not doing nothing that you can't do. I'm not doing nothing you can't do. You probably can do it better. I'm not here to make you look up to me and worship me. I'm just your brother. Worship no one but God. Bow down to no one but God. Serve no one but God. And give God all the honor and the glory for whatever you do because you can't do nothing of yourself, nor can I. When you think like that, when you act like that, when you're not carried away with yourself, then you can walk humble on the earth and know that you came for a short while and you got a job to do and you do it. And when God says, well done, you pack it up and you come on home, but you have left behind good things. And I say that each one of you should strive to leave behind something of value. And the best thing we can leave behind is wise children to take the future and make it better than we have made the past. Thank you for listening and may God bless you as I greet you in peace. Assalamu alaikum.